श्री श्री राधा गोकुलान जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त बिंदा जय अद्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त बिंदा जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त बिंदा Hare Krishna. Good morning to everyone. So this morning we are reading from Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Madhya Lila, chapter number six, entitled "The Liberation of Sarvabhoom Bhattacharya," and we are reading from uh, text numbers ninety and ninety-one. So I will recite ninety, and then we'll do ninety-one together. In har sharira shaba Ishvar lakshan. महाप्रेम वश तुम्हें पनचा दर्शन गोपीनाथ आचार्य कंटिन्यूड यू हैव सीन द सिम्टम्स ऑफ द सुप्रीम पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हैड इन द बॉडी ऑफ श्री चैतन्य महाप्रभु ड्यूरिंग हिज अब्जॉर्बशन इन एन एक्सटैटिक मूड सो सर्वभौम भट्टाचार्य हैड द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू सी श्री चैतन्य महाप्रभु इन हिज एक्सटेसी इन हिज महाभाव displaying all the sattvika bhavas the ecstatic symptoms that one displays in pure love of krishna so that was such a fortunate darshan for sarvabhoom bhattacharya to have i mean who could wish for something more amazing than seeing shri chaitanya mahaprabhu in complete ecstasy mahaprabhu is prema purushottam he is the supreme lord who comes to exhibit prema and give prema so sarvabhoom bhattacharya was so fortunate he was able to witness but now having witnessed mahaprabhu's mahabhav what happens <coughs> text number 91 so you can repeat line after line tabuta ishvara gyan nahaya tomar तबुता ईश्वर ज्ञान न होया तुम्हार ईश्वर रा माया ए बोली व्यवहार ईश्वर रा माया ए बोली व्यवहार तबुता ईश्वर ज्ञान न होया तुम्हार ईश्वर रा माया ए बोली व्यवहार सॉरी दिफ इज डिफरेंट चीन you can do it in whatever tune you like tabu ta ishwar gyan na hoya tumar ishwar ra maya e boli vyavahar mathe ji tabu ta ishwar gyan na hoya tumar ईश्वर रा माया ए बोली व्यवहार तबुता स्टिल हाउ एवर ईश्वर ज्ञान नॉलेज ऑफ द सुप्रीम पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हैड ना नॉट होया देयर इज तुमार योर ईश्वर रा ऑफ द लॉर्ड Maya, the illusion. A, this, Bolly, saying, 
Vyavahar, the general term. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, Shri A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki. Despite directly perceiving the symptoms of the Supreme Lord in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you cannot understand Him. This is commonly called illusion. So Sarvabhama Bhattacharya saw Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in all his ecstasy, but he could not understand because Ishvarera Maya A, he was in Maya at that point. Anyway. Purport. Gopinathacharya is pointing out that Sarvabhama Bhattacharya had already seen uncommon symptoms of ecstasy manifested in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. These uncommon symptoms of ecstatic love indicated the Supreme Person. But despite having seen all these symptoms, the Bhattacharya could not understand the Lord's transcendental nature. He was considering the Lord's pastimes to be mundane. This was certainly due to illusion. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jaya. Sarvabhama Bhattacharya perhaps committed the gravest mistake. He perceived the Supreme Person to be an ordinary person and he perceived the supreme symptoms of love to be ordinary manifestations of material emotions. Now, if Sarvabhama Bhattacharya could misjudge the Supreme Lord to be an ordinary person, and the supreme symptoms of love to be ordinary material emotions, if that misunderstanding could take place, then it means in the material world, any misunderstanding can take place. If you can misjudge someone to that extent that Sarvabhama Bhattacharya misjudged the Supreme Person, then it means misjudgment in this world is something that is definitely going to happen. Put your hand up if you have ever been misjudged. Yes, you're all the humble devotees don't want to say. We've been misjudged. How did it feel to be misjudged? Judged. Say? Judged. You feel judged, yeah. <laughs> What did that feel emotionally to you when you felt someone misjudged you? How did it feel? <clears throat> Vishishta, have you ever been misjudged? How did it feel? Upset. You feel very upset. You feel very depressed. You feel very dejected. You feel um, unjustly treated. It's not very nice to be misjudged. Uh, Mahaprabhu, the Supreme Lord, is not spared from being misjudged. He's the Supreme Person, and even people misjudge Him. Do you know, even Krishna was misjudged. Satrajit had acquired the Shamantaka Jewel. The Shamantaka Jewel, which gives all wealth, all prosperity, all well-being, and Krishna was in Dvarka, Krishna said to Satrajit, at least give it to Ugrasen, he's the chief, he's the king. All the wealth we have should be used to honor the king. Encourage Satrajit to give it over, Satrajit was not budging. No, no, I'll keep it, I'll hold on to it. The Shamanteka jewel was so effulgent that when uh, Satrajit would come with it, people would think, my God, the sun god has appeared. Later on, Satrajit's younger brother, Prashena, uh, was killed and the jewel was stolen. Satrajit put two and two together. Krishna, he told me to give it to Ugrasen. I didn't give it to him. Later on, my brother Prasen gets killed. Someone takes the jewel from him. It must be Krishna. Krishna's behind it. Krishna killed my brother and Krishna stole the jewel. And what did Satrajit do? He put the rumors all over Dwarka. And then later on, Krishna 
hunted down the jewel and they found out that actually a lion had killed Prashena and Jambavan had killed the lion and Krishna got the jewel back from Jambavan along with Jambavati. Even Krishna was misjudged. Krishna was misjudged. Mahaprabhu was misjudged. Can you think of any devotees in Bhagavatam who were misjudged? Marajambarish is the, probably the one that first comes to mind. Durvasa Muni said, you have been disrespectful to me. Ambarish was doing everything possible to make sure he would not be disrespectful to Durvasa, but Durvasa still said, no, you have been disrespectful to me. Of course, Krishna was not at all happy with that and Krishna sent the Sudarshan Chakra <laughs> to hunt down Durvas for his offence and finally when Durvasa had no other recourse he came to Vishnu himself he said Vishnu help me I misjudged him Aham bhakta padadhino hashvantantra ivadvija Vishnu said I can't help you Aham bhakta padadhino even I am dependent on my devotee hashvantantra ivadvija I am not independent I can't help you my friend you have to go to Ambarish and seek his forgiveness for misjudging him. The greatest devotees in the Bhagavatam were misjudged. Prabhupada was misjudged. Can you imagine? Prabhupada's god brothers came to him one time and said, You are trying to take over Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's position. Why are you taking the name Prabhupada? We can't imagine how painful that must have felt for Srila Prabhupada to be misjudged in that way. They said, you are trying to usurp, take his position. There's only one Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. How you uh, use the name Prabhupada? Prabhupada was so upset. And then, you know what Prabhupada did? He said, go to my desk. He went to the desk, picked up a letterhead. And on the top of the letterhead, what did it say? Tri Dandi Goswami, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Prabhupada said, see, I don't take the name Prabhupada, I don't use it. But my disciples, to show the relevant respect to the spiritual master who has delivered the science of Krishna to them, they use it out of respect, I don't take. Prabhupada, who had given his whole life to becoming the sold-out servant of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, was being misjudged and accused that you are taking Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's position. So misjudgment is going on all the time. So next time you're misjudged, next time someone uh, points out something that you feel, no, no, they've got it all wrong, don't feel bad. It happened to Krishna, <laughs> it happened to Mahaprabhu, it happened to the greatest devotees in the Bhagavatam, it even happened to Srila Prabhupada. No one is free from being the target of misjudgment. But now let me ask you, put your hand up if you have misjudged someone else. Okay. <laughs> we have all misjudged others also. Uh, the other day I was in class and I uh, woke up David Prabhu and then later on he told me I wasn't sleeping I was like sorry I misjudged you <laughs> <laughs> these misjudgments happen all of the time <clears throat> we misjudge people sometimes we may feel so bad when we are misjudged but when we compare it to how many times we have misjudged others then you may think, okay, it's not so bad. Like, in comparison to how much I've misjudged others, how much misjudgment I've been the object of, maybe it's not so bad, actually. So much of our life is about making judgments of others which are unfounded. Once I was on Sankirtan and I met someone who went on a Vipassana retreat. Some of you may know. 
And vipassana is like a Buddhist retreat meditation. <clears throat> so you go there for 11 days, and uh, the rule is for 10 days, you know what you can't do, right? You can't say one word. Monavrat for 10 days. So I asked this person, what was your realization from the Vipassana retreat? He said, I realized one scary thing in my life. I said, what? He said, I turned up in this Vipassana center with all these people that I've never met before. So can you imagine, you're with all of these people, you've never met any of them before, but you cannot say one word to each other. So for 10 days you're living with all these strangers <laughs> who you've never met before in your whole life, but you're not able to say one word to them. He said, after 10 days, when we could finally speak to each other, I started speaking to all these different people and he said, it blew my mind because I realized in these 10 days, I had created so many conceptions in my mind of what someone is, how they are, what their personality is, what's they're going on in their mind. And just by speaking to them for two minutes, I realized I was completely wrong. And he said, I got so scared because I realized in my life, I'm walking past people every day who I'm not even speaking to. And I'm making so many conceptions in my mind of who they are, what they are, how they are. And it's all completely wrong. I said, <laughs> that was a good realization, you know. It was, uh, you know, sometimes just by observing, even in a devotee community, isn't it? You just observe others and you think, ah, oh, that, that person's proud, you know. I can see, I can see by the way that person walks. I can see, the, by the way the person walks, I can see they're proud. By the way the person sings the kirtan, I can see they're trying to get a lot of attention. By the way that person, you know, asks questions in the Bhagavatam class, I can see so many conceptions we make of others. Uh, it's very scary actually. Um, here Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya misjudged Mahaprabhu. Misjudgment is very, very dangerous in our spiritual life. And there could be different reasons why we misjudge. The first reason why we misjudge people or situations is demonstrated by Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya because our basic philosophy of life is wrong. Sarva Bhoma's philosophy was the philosophy of Mayavad. In Vedic uh, terminology, when we talk about philosophy, the Sanskrit word is darshan. So we talk about sad darshan, the six systems of Vedic philosophy. Darshan means philosophy, but it literally means vision. So probably the closest English word to uh, darshan is worldview. Our darshan, our, our philosophy that we ex, uh, accept in our life determines our view of the world, our view of people, our view of events, how we decode everything around us. Because Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya had a darshan which was mayavadi, which was impersonalistic, therefore everything he was seeing and everything he was experiencing, he was seeing it through the eyes of mayavad. And therefore, when he saw the spiritual emotions of Mahaprabhu, he thought them to be material. When he saw uh, symptoms of ecstasy, he thought it to be simply sentiment. Um, when we go around in life and we have uh, the wrong philosophy, philosophical deficiency, then we were bound to make misjudgment. And therefore, uh, even Krishna says in the Gita, Ya Shastra Vidimutsra Je Vartate Kamakarata, that if one does not refer to Shastra and see the world through the eyes of Shastra, then they will know, not know what to do, what not to do. They will take religion as irreligion, irreligion as religion, 
they will basically get everything upside down because their basic vision, worldview, darshan of life is incorrect. So Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya was a victim of this. He misjudged the situation, the person, because he had philosophical deficiency. But now let me share with you some more instances from the Chaitanya Charitamrita which show us why and how we can make a misjudgment. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Vrindavan, then he wanted to go alone. When you go to the Dham, you don't go with many. Because when you go with many, then people want to talk, people want to discuss, and then you get engaged in so many things, you can't meditate and absorb and do your bhajan in solitude with Krishna. So Mahaprabhu wanted to go alone, but the devotees convinced him, no, no, you must take someone with you. So he took Balabhadra Bhattacharya with him. They went through Vrindava in many places. Mahaprabhu was in ecstasy. Many thousands of people came. And towards the end of the trip, they arrived at Akrura Ghat. At Akrura Ghat, one day, Mahaprabhu was residing there, and all the Brijabhasis came to Akrura Ghat in great enthusiasm, they said, have you heard, have you heard, have you heard the news? What's the news? The news is that Krishna has appeared again at Kali Agat. Krishna has appeared in Vrindavan again and he's dancing on the hoods of Kali <laughs> Mahaprabhu heard and he just, uh, he didn't say anything, he just was silent. But this was the talk of the town. Krishna has appeared again in Vrindavan. <laughs> the amazing thing is Krishna had appeared in Vrindavan as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> but they never saw that Krishna. So Mahaprabhu was silent. Few days passed and Balabhadra Bhattacharya came. Balabhadra Bhattacharya came to Mahaprabhu. He said, Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu, have you heard? Have you heard? Krishna has appeared again in Vrindavan. He's in front of Mahaprabhu. He says, have you heard? Krishna has appeared again. He's dancing on the hoods of Kaliya. Tave tandre kohe prabhu chapatiya mariye murkhera vakya murka hoila panditana Tabe Tandre Kohe Prabhu, when Balabhadra Bhattacharya came to Mahaprabhu and said, Have you heard Krishna is here? What did Mahaprabhu do? Chapiya Maraya. He gave him a big slap. He just gave, Mahaprabhu just gave him a big slap. I mean, Bhattacharya, he wasn't expecting that one. And then what did Mahaprabhu say? Murkhera Vakya. You have heard the words of fools, Murkha Hoila, and therefore you yourself have become a fool. Pandit Hana, when actually you're supposed to be a learned man. Balabhadra Bhattacharya was, he couldn't fathom it. Mahaprabhu said, just wait, you'll see. Then later on the news reached, Oh, no, no, it wasn't Krishna and Kaliya. Actually, there was a fisherman. <laughs> and the fisherman was in the ship in the Yamuna and he was shining the torch. And people were thinking the, uh, the ship, the ship was Kaliya. The torch was the jewels shining on the heads of Kaliya and the fisherman was Krishna. Mahaprabhu looked at Balabhadra Bhattacharya and he said, Murkhera Vakya, because you have heard the words of irrational people, Murka Hoila, you yourself have become an irrational fool. It's very interesting. This is the second reason why you can misjudge people, because you get the wrong information about people. Did you hear what this person did? Did you hear what this devotee did? Did you hear, you know, about how this happened? And then we hear so much information secondhand, and then based on all this information, we make a judgment about someone or something. 
is very, very dangerous. Like say for example, someone comes to you and says, have you heard about this devotee? It's very, very dangerous. Because all you're hearing is information from this person. Do you know if the information is accurate? Do you know if the information is comprehensive? Do you know if the information is balanced? But then when you hear that information, you form a judgment on someone else. And then you know what happens, right? You're very likely to tell a second person what your judgment is. And then they form a judgment. And then they tell someone else and they form, and before you know it, there's all these judgments which could be misjudgments based on the wrong information. Murkera vakya murka hoila. If you hear the words of fools, you yourself will become a fool. Mahaprabhu told Balabhadra Bhattacharya. So we have to be very, very careful. Because we hear so many things about so many events and so many people and so many situations. That's why management <laughs> is a blessing and it's a curse. Management is a blessing because you can do some service for the Vaishnavas. Management is a curse because you're hearing so many things and often you have no idea. You have no idea. And when you hear things, it's very difficult not to make an opinion. But we must be careful because murkera vakya, murka hoila. If you hear the words of fools, you yourself will become a fool. Misjudgment can take place in a different way. When Mahaprabhu reached Jagannath Puri, then he was having interactions with many devotees and one of the devotees he was having an interaction with was Pradyumna Mishra. Pradyumna Mishra came to Mahaprabhu and he was, he was astute, he was on it, as we would say. He said, Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu, I want to hear Harikatha from you. That was good. Yes, hear Harikatha from Mahaprabhu, that would be amazing. What was Mahaprabhu's reply? No, no, I don't know so much. What do I know about Harikatha? Shishiradha Gokulananda ki, Sitaram Lakshman Hanuman ki, Kohanitai ki jai. He said, I don't know so much about Harikatha, but I know a person who does. Why don't you go and hear from Ramananda Rai? Even I heard from Ramananda Rai on the banks of the Godavari and Ramananda Rai, he knows the art of how to share Harikatha. He is a great Vaishnav. So Pajumna Mishra thought, wow, even Mahaprabhu heard from Ramananda Rai, maybe I should also go and hear Harikatha from Ramananda Rai. So he went. He knocked on the door. Ramananda Rai, can I uh, meet Ramananda Rai? <laughs> so one assistant was there. He said, was, he said no, I'm, I want to see Ramananda Rai. I want to hear Harikatha. He said, Ramananda Rai? Say, Dhunhe Lana Rai Nibrita Udyane. Ramananda Rai? Nibrita Udyane. He's in a solitary place right now. Oh, he must be doing his bhajan for Krishna in a solitary place. Mahaprabhu told me he's very advanced in Harikatha. He's in a solitary place. Oh, wonderful. What is he doing in the solitary place? Nija nartak gitera shikhaya nartane. In the solitary place, Ramananda Rai is with two very beautiful women. Okay, I understood the solitary place part. Now it's getting a bit fishy. Pradyumna Mishra is hearing. By the way, Pradyumna Mishra is a Paka Brahmana. Mantra, Tantra, Visharada, he knows everything. So he's hearing now. Mahaprabhu is in a solitary place. He's with two very, uh, Ramananda Rai is in a solitary place with two very beautiful women. Okay, okay. What's he doing? Nije Nartak Gitera Shikaya Nartane. 
he is with two exquisitely beautiful women in a solitary place and he's doing drama, he's singing, dancing, and he's massaging them. Prajumna Mishra was completely baffled. He said, but don't, his assistant said, but don't worry, he'll be back soon, and then you can hear Harikata from him. <laughs> okay, I'm not. So Prajumna Mishra was thinking, my God, like, I don't know, do I want to hear Harikatha from Pradyumna Mishra, uh, from Ramananda Rai? But he didn't say anything. He just walked away silent. And then he began keeping a distance. So Mahaprabhu is Antaryami. Mahaprabhu knows. Sarvasya Chaham Ridhisan, he's in the heart, he knows. So Mahaprabhu came to Pradyumna Mishra. Oh, Pradyumna Mishra, did you hear from Ramananda Rai? Did you hear Harikatha? Pujumna Mishra was quiet. <laughs> he didn't have anything to say. In his mind he was thinking, how will I hear from Ramananda Rai? He's doing such activities. And then Mahaprabhu could understand that Pujumna Mishra had misunderstood Ramananda Rai. Mahaprabhu looked at uh, Pujumna Mishra. He said, Dadavi Prakriti Hore Munera Piman. Durvar Indriya Korek Vishaya Grahan Dharavi Prakriti Munir Munira Piman. He says, for an ordinary conditioned soul, even a wooden form of the opposite gender will agitate their mind. But Ramananda Rai, he is a completely different devotee. He is Swarupena Vyavastiti. Ramananda Rai is a personality who is situated in his Swarup as a maidservant of Sri Radha. And therefore, when he is with these Deva Dasis in a solitary place, he is training them and intimately associating with them to make a wonderful offering for Jagannath. And because he is situated in his Swarup, he is not in one tiny bit agitated by the situation. Prajumna Mishra was like, his mind was blown. Oh my God, I made a misjudgment. Kaviraj Goswami says, Mahaprabhur Bhakta Ganer Durga Me Mahima Taharama Nandir Bhav Bhakti Prema Sima Mahaprabhur Bhakta Ganer Durga Me Mahima Don't ever try to calculate the incredible glories and ecstatic love of the devotees of Mahaprabhu. Dahe Ramanandir Bhav. Ramananda Rai's Bhav is so deep. Bhakti Simapaya that he has taken it to the extreme limit. So Prajumna Mishra realized, oh my God, I made a big mistake. Because he had a certain expectation. He had a certain expectation of how someone should be. And when you have a certain expectation of how someone should be, and you see something different, then immediately you can misjudge that person. We should not expect everyone to conduct their life exactly as we conduct our life. Because everyone is an individual. And therefore, everyone will have their own mode of expression. But when we are stereotyped and we see through the lens of our expectation someone else, then we can very easily make a judgment because our expectations are actually unreasonable. This is another way in which you can make a misjudgment. There's more ways in which you can make a misjudgment. In Jagannath Puri, Mahaprabhu was meeting many, many individuals and one day an individual came and his name was Ramachandra Puri. And Ramachandra Puri was someone who was greatly respected by Mahaprabhu because he was the god-brother of his spiritual master. He was the god-brother of Ishvara Puri, both disciples of Madhavendra Puri. So when Ramachandra Puri came to Jagannath Puri, then Mahaprabhu offered him all respect. However, Ramachandra Puri had one 
bad quality. And the one bad quality was, he was always finding faults in others. Therefore, you know what he would do, right? <laughs> it's described, Kaviraj Goswami describes it. Eitasva bhava tandra agraha koriya piche ninda kare age bahutha koyana. What would he do? Eitasva bhava tandra. What was the svabhava, the nature of Ramachandra Puri? What was his svabhav? What was his nature? Agraha Koriya, with great enthusiasm, with great gusto, he would tell the devotees, take prasad, take prasad, eat, eat as much as you like. This is a festival. This is the movement of chanting, dancing and feasting. Eat, 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 take as much as you like. And then what he would he do? Piche Ninda. And then after encouraging the devotees, e, 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 what would he do? Piche, after doing that, Ninda, he would criticize them. All of these guys are eating too much. <laughs> Just look at all of these devotees of Mahaprabhu, they're eating so much. I knew there was something about them that you couldn't quite trust. This is amazing, huh? He even came to Mahaprabhu. He said, look, I've seen on the ground there are so many ants. That means you're eating too many sweets. Mahaprabhu was very humble. I mean, in India, there's ants everywhere. <laughs> Mahaprabhu said, okay, no, no, you are right, you are right. I'm eating too much. So I will, I will reduce my eating by half. And then what did Ramachandra Puri come and do? He comes to Mahaprabhu, he says, let, let me tell you a few things. Yukta haraviha dasya, yukta chais dasya karmashu, yukta svapno vabo dasya, yoga bhavati dukaha. He comes to Mahaprabhu after Mahaprabhu has reduced his eating by half because of his criticism. And then he comes to Mahaprabhu and quotes Gita. And Krishna says in Gita, you must be regulated, don't eat too much and don't eat too less. So I, I want to humbly submit to you, Mahaprabhu, that you are not eating enough. You, you are not following Krishna. You, are, you have deviated from the path of the Bhagavad Gita because you are eating too less. This is a fault finder. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Another reason why we may misjudge is because we have something within our own heart where we feel the need to find some deficiency in others in order to make us feel better about ourselves. If you have a line like this and you want to make it longer without touching it, you know how you do it, right? How do you do it, Ram Lakshman? Draw a shorter line next to it. Put another line next to it and make it shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. When someone is stagnant in their devotional life, when someone is not growing, when someone is not increasing in transcendental happiness as a result of their developing purity in the practice of bhakti, then what will they do? Naturally, they will revert to fault-finding because we need to make ourselves feel better somehow. This is another way we can misjudge. So this is the reality that we are so much apt to misjudge others. Sarva Bhom Bhattacharya misjudged because of philosophical deficiency. Balabhadra Bhattacharya misjudged because of informational deficiency. Pradyumna Mishra misjudged because of expectational deficiency. And Ramachandra Puri misjudged because of internal deficiency, not growing, fault finding, attitude problem. The reason I'm sharing all of this is for all of us to meditate 
that before we, li in life we have to make judgments. In life we have to discriminate because we're living in the world. But when you make judgments of situations or judgments of other individuals, ask yourself very closely, is my philosophy correct? Is my information correct? Are my expectations correct? And is my attitude correct? Because if those four things are not correct, then there's a good chance you will be incorrect. You will be incorrect in your judgment of someone. And if you're incorrect in your judgment of someone, then it's aparad. Now, in the case of Sarva Bhauma, Bhattacharya, Pradyumna Mishra, and uh, uh, Balabhadra Bhattacharya, even though they made a misjudgment, because they had someone who gave them feedback and they were humble to take it and get back on the right path, they were saved. They were saved. Sarvabhama Bhattacharya got it wrong, but later on Gopinath Acharya, through his association, got him back on the right track. Balabhadra Bhattacharya got it wrong, but Mahaprabhu gave him a good slap and put him back into line. He was saved. Pradyumna Mishra also got it wrong. But Mahaprabhu told him, Mahaprabhu the Bhakta Ganer, Durga Me Mahima, don't be careful. These devotees are exalted. Yanra Chitta Krishna Prem, Koriya Yudoi, Tandra Vakya Kriya, Mudra Vigya Yana Bujoi. You may not be able to understand the mind, word, and activities of a Vaishnava. Be careful, Prajumna Mishra. So he got back on track. But Ramachandra Puri did not get back on track because his attitude was wrong. He made a misjudgment and because his fundamental attitude was flawed, he could not get back on the right track and he lost everything. So here are a few things for us to meditate on today. Number one, you have to make judgments in life. You have to discriminate. But number one, be very, very careful. Ask yourself these four things before you make a judgment. Number two, always be ready that I may be wrong in my judgment and be ready to be corrected. Sometimes we make a misjudgment and then we know we're wrong, but we don't want to change because out of ego. Have you ever had an argument with someone? And you're having an argument with someone and in the middle of the argument there's a moment there's a moment when you realize, you know what? I'm wrong. <laughs> it's like a ping moment. Like, oh my God, I'm wrong. But now you're in the middle of this passionate argument. And most of the time what we do is, we just carry on. <laughs> carry on fighting. You have to be open that maybe I misjudged the situation, maybe I misjudged the person. <coughs> The third thing I want to share with you, because we are so apt to make a misjudgment, we should not make judgments on things that we don't need to make judgments about. Have you noticed in the world how there's such a tendency to make, have a judgment on everything? Even things that you don't know anything about, even though on things you have no influence over, and even on things that are nothing to do with you. This is commonly known as Gramya Katha, village talks. Village talks or prajaupa or gossip means talking about things that number one, you don't know about, number two, uh, you have no influence over, and number three, have nothing at all to do with you. Why would you? Therefore, Mahaprabhu told Raghunath Das Goswami, Gramya Katha Na Shuni Be, Gramya Varta Na Kahi Be, Balana Kahi Be Ar, Balana Pari Be. Gramya Katha Na Shuni Be, don't listen to this village talks. Gramya Katha Na Kahi Be, don't talk such things. You got better things to do with your life. 
We're so much apt to make misjudgments. Why are we going to try and make judgments on things that we have nothing to do with? But, and this is the final point I'll end on before I open it up, if anyone has any question. The only way we'll be free from feeling the intense need to make judgments on everything is if we are absorbed in a higher reality. If we are absorbed in higher topics, if we have a much more relishable uh, engagement for our consciousness. Therefore, <clears throat> in the beginning, when Sukadev begins to speak Bhagavatam to Sutta Goswami, uh, sorry, to uh, Parikshit Maharaj, Sukadev quotes a beautiful verse. He says, I'm so happy, uh, Parikshit, that you've come to hear Krishna Katha, Hari Katha. Shrotavya dinira jendra nrinam shanti shahashrasha apasyatam atma tattvam griheshu grihamedinam. He says, those who are apasyatam atma tattvam, those who are blind to spiritual topics, blind to the spiritual reality, blind to the uh, relishable katha of Krishna, what will they be? Griheshu, Grihamedinam, naturally, if they are blind to such topics, then they will be very much awake to Griheshu, Grihamedinam, the temporal topics of the movements of what's going on in this material world. <clears throat> and he says, for such people, Shrotavya, Dinirajendra, Renam, Shanti, Sahasrasa, they have so many topics to hear about. But all of those topics that they're interested in hearing about are topics of the material world. Topics of the temporal happenings of material affairs. Gramya Katha, Prajalpa. Something that will never bring you any satisfaction to the heart. <clears throat> so unless and until one is uh, becomes awake to the Atma Tattva, the the reality of the spiritual world. Unless one becomes captured by those topics, one will naturally be attracted to the topics of this world and begin to make judgments on so many things which are, don't need to be made judgments about. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur was producing a newspaper called Nadia Prakash. It was like a back to Godhead, but it was Nadia Prakash and it was daily. So there was one person who came to him and said, you, Swamiji, you produce a, a religious magazine daily? What will you speak about daily in a religious magazine? I mean, the philosophy doesn't change, it's the same. You'll run out of things to say. <laughs> Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur looked at him and he said, if they have so many newspapers which are coming out in the morning and evening about the affairs of the material world, there's so many things, Baba, to talk about in the spiritual world. A daily newspaper is not enough. There's so many things to talk about. <clears throat> so we want to live in that world. We want to live in Krishna's world, in the world of Vrindavan. <clears throat> this morning I was chanting Japa, and <clears throat> before I was chanting Japa, I was, uh, I was reading uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti's uh, Vrindavan Astakam, eight prayers in uh, glorification of Vrindavan. And in the first verse of that uh, Ashtakam, he says, um, I don't pray for... Uh, I don't pray for mystic powers, I don't pray for impersonal liberation, I don't pray for liberation to Vaikuntha. And then he said something which like woke me up. He said, I don't even pray for pure love of Krishna. I only pray that I will be able to live in Vrindavan. So I was like, I was looking at that line. I don't pray to have pure love of Krishna. So I looked at that line, I thought, let me just check the Sanskrit here. Did this person get it right, the translator? <laughs> so I looked at the, um, the Sanskrit. Prema pi nasyat. He said, I don't pray for pure love of Krishna. 
I only pray that I will be able to live in Vrindavan. I thought, wow. What occurred to me is that Vrindavan is Chintamani Dham. So, I mean, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is an astute personality, of course, Paramahamsa Vaishnav. So maybe in my philosophical speculation, my understanding is that if you get residence in Vrindavan, because Vrindavan is Chintamani Dham, it fulfills everything the soul could ever desire. Then if you get residence in Vrindavan, then naturally everything else comes. So therefore he says, I don't pray for pure love of Krishna. I only pray to reside in Vrindavan. Because if you're living in Vrindavan, everything will come. <clears throat> but how do you live in Vrindavan? Therefore Rupa Goswami says, Tanna maru pacharita di sukirtanano Shmrityo kramena rasana manasi niyojya Distan vraje tadanuragi janalugami kalam nayad akilamitya padesha saram. He says the upadesha sar, the essence of all instructions. Tan nama rupa charita di sukirtananu shmrityo kramena rasana manasi niyojya. You should absorb your mind in the name, fame, form, qualities, pastimes, and unlimited transcendental sweetness of Krishna's pastimes and Krishna's narrations this done and in this way always live in Vrindavan Tadanuragi Jananugami and follow in the footsteps of the residents of Braj Kalam Nayed Akilamityupad this is how you should utilize all your time utilize time in being absorbed in Hari Katha, Hari Kirtan, Hari Prachar. Then we have no time to get absorbed in affairs of this material world that are nothing to do with us. And then we have no opportunity to, uh, less opportunity of misjudging. <clears throat> the world is ultimately a dream, such a dream, this material world. Isn't it? You don't wake up in the morning and think about your dream and say, in the dream, why did he say that? And why did he say that? Oh no, in the dream, why did it end up like that? Why did it? No one wakes up in the morning and analyzes their dreams like that. Have you ever done? You've analyzed, <laughs> Ram Lakshman does. <laughs> no one analyzes their dreams generally because you... <laughs> that, we'll add that disclaimer in the footnote. Generally. <laughs> Generally, you don't analyze your dream because in a dream, you know irrational things happen. And in a dream, you know that ultimately it's just a momentary experience. So, <laughs> the whole world is like a dream. It's like irrational things happen. Yeah, well, welcome to the dream. In the dream, irrational things happen and you don't feel like, oh my God, it's something strange. There's something strange, an irrational thing is happening in the material world. Well, yeah, it's a dream. And you don't focus on it because you know it's all transitory. It's a phantasmagoria, as Prabhupada used to say. So, <clears throat> these are some thoughts I'd like to share with you, just to recap. Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya misjudged Mahaprabhu. The tendency to misjudge in this world is so strong, we have been misjudged, but we misjudge many other people, situations, events. Why do we misjudge? Because philosophically we're deficient. Informationally we're deficient. In terms of our expectations, we're deficient. And in terms of our attitude, we're deficient. And therefore the tendency to misjudge is so strong Therefore, when we do have to make a judgment, when we do have to discriminate, let's very, be very aware of these biases. Number two, don't make judgments on things that you don't need to make judgments about. And number three, ultimately what we have to do is get absorbed in the spiritual reality because that is real reality. Otherwise, just the affairs of this world 
and the different things going on in this world, if our mind is hijacked by all of these things, then uh, we will miss the point of life. <clears throat> and so these are some points I wanted to share um, as we remember the misjudgment of Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya, but then his ultimate um, re-entrance into uh, proper understanding by the grace of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, so I'll stop there. If anyone has any uh, comments, questions. Yeah, so people want to uh, tell us so many things. <laughs> Even yesterday I got an email from someone telling me so many things about another devotee and I was like, I don't know if I need to know this, you know. I don't think I can help the situation. It's very difficult because as soon as we hear something, our consciousness becomes coloured. So first thing is, in that situation, we should try to remain always neutral and understand that there are many sides to a story. There are many perspectives and we should first of all try ourselves to withhold ourselves from making a judgment until we're 100% sure. That's the first thing you have to be careful of. And then the second thing is you have to encourage those two devotees or the devotee who has a problem with another devotee or something to work it out amongst themselves or have someone with them to work it out between themselves. They say a lot of problems in the world would be solved if we started talking to each other rather than about each other. We have such a tendency to talk about each other, but if we would just talk to each other, maybe so many things would be clarified. So that must be done in an appropriate way. But you have to, uh, that's why you have to become, uh, in terms of your own, uh, securing your own well-being, that's why you have to become absorbed in the spiritual reality. You see, when you're absorbed in the spiritual reality, then you won't even be attracted to making a judgment. But when we're not absorbed in the spiritual reality, then we, we're very attached to making a judgment. Because again, our consciousness is in the material. But when you're so absorbed by higher topics, then these things, you just think, this is just a dream. Why, why get so like, worked up about all of these things? Of course, if it's your service, it's a different thing. You can't just be like, if someone comes to your problem as a manager and says like, poo hoo, there's a problem, there's a problem. Don't worry, it's all a dream. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that one, it doesn't work. <laughs> No, no, I need a solution. <laughs> Internally, we should know it's a dream. Externally, we have to solve things and help the situation. There's no, uh, there's no substitute for becoming spiritually absorbed. One who has spiritual absorption is the wealthiest person in the world. Because it is that absorption, that purity is your immunity from all the gunk of the material world. Your purity and absorption in the spiritual energy is your immunity from the gunk of the material world. <coughs> so unless one is absorbed, therefore, <coughs> I was thinking actually that sometimes when devotees take up leadership or management, they become so busy that they're not able to be spiritually absorbed but actually they're the ones that have to be the most absorbed because they're the ones which are dealing so much with the gunk of the material world so uh, one great personality once told me if you increase in your responsibility for the movement by this much you're not allowed to increase 
your responsibility this much unless you increase your absorption this much. Because you can take more and more responsibility. But if you don't have spiritual absorption, Shurasya Dharya Nishitam Duratyaya is a razor's edge. So yeah, let us become absorbed. That purity is the immunity. I'll repeat it. Um, so, in, in your class, uh, I find also that um, that's okay now. Yeah. Um, something can be hard uh, if we think that everything is coming from the spiritual world, there is also a source from our ju judgment. So I was thinking, when you were speaking about all those examples, the one with Pundarik and Gadadar. Gadadar is... Pudim Namishra. Oh, Pundarik Vedinidhi. Yeah. Okay, yeah, right. And he, he, because he's misjudging uh, this great devotee, because of his of material appearances, he will take shelter of him and he will take his uh, as his spiritual master. So I was thinking, uh, in the spiritual world, if you begin by chanta, to be neutral, to be uh, to our everything. But at some point, we because we have to take a position, we have to take some emotional uh, 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 identity, direction, that means we can see the same thing, but we will have a different, uh, different judgment about it. And those conflicts, they are also existing in the spiritual world and they can be reflected uh, in the material world. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, definitely. There are judgments that go on in the spiritual world. There's uh, the right wing and the left wing and, um, you know... Uh, <coughs> Who's that? Someone went to the village of Chandravali. Who's that? Das Goswami, someone went to the village of Chandravali and said, no, no, we, they were very angry because Chandravali is the competitor of Radharani. So, yeah, like this, so many judgments are going on in the spiritual world, but it's all done from the platform of uh, purity, transcendental judgment. So, yeah, everything is there, but... Yeah, we must be careful in the material world because we have so much of a tendency towards uh, uh, binadrik, separatist, to create division, to create conflict, to create difference. Even the judgment in the spiritual world, although on one level there's difference, they, it creates actually a different transcendental unity as well. It's, uh, Whereas judgment in this world becomes very divisive and very bitter. Whereas judgment in the spiritual world becomes a, a transcendental unification of sweetness. So yeah, everything is there in the spiritual world. and <clears throat> Yeah, there is transcendental judgment as well. Prabhupada said, I'm a kachori mukha. Especially like kachoris. <laughs> That's a transcendental judgment. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Philosophic background or expectation or understanding, 
that allows us to to change from the wrong to the right. We know we are wrong, but we simply don't know how to be right. So is there something that uh, allows us to make a good judgment? <coughs> More important than necessarily making the right or the wrong judgment is to have the right motivation. Even sometimes if you make a misjudgment but your motivation is good, people will understand the language of your heart. Even if sometimes you make the right judgment but your motivation is wrong, people will understand the language of the heart. <laughs> We are infallible beings. We have imperfect senses. We are subject to illusion. Therefore, we will make mistakes. But the one thing we do have a control over is whether you want to be a cheater or not. Whether you want to be uh, devious in your mentality or not. That's the one thing you do have control over. So therefore, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur once said that weakness is not a problem. But cheating, bad mentality, covering things up, brushing it under the carpet, that's a problem. So the best way to, make, to train yourself to make good judgments is have a good mentality. Always try to do things for the right reason, as a, in a mood of a servant. In every situation, we should always think, how can I be a servant in this situation? And if in that situation you may have to make a judgment as a servant, do it as a servant. And then even sometimes, because we are imperfect, we may make a wrong judgment. Still, people will understand the language of your heart. Many times people said to me something that was wrong. They misjudged me. But because I, I know they love me, I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel bad. We all experience like that. So we must have a good heart. Surid. Krishna says, Suridam Sarva Bhutanam. I'm a friend to all living entities. So somehow or other, because we're following in the line of Krishna, we also have to become Surid, as Prabhupada said, you're ever well-wisher. So we have to become a well-wisher of the devotees, a well-wisher of the community. Always be an agent of positive change. Bring positive energy to the Sangha of the Vaishnavas. Bring optimism, bring devotion, bring spiritual nourishment. This is what we should bring to the table. And in the midst of all of that, any mistakes that may be made, Krishna will forgive. Vaishnavas will forgive. Okay, it's going on late. Thank you so much. Apologies if there were any wrong things I said. And uh, thank you for your time and patience. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Ki Jai. Jai. Jai.